like to welcome everybody. For those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Jill Klein, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director for CTRL this year. Um, this is a special place for us as faculty, because this is our sort of what I like to describe our safe and successful place. It's a place where we get to come and have some of those conversations sometimes that maybe we don't want our students to know we're having. And so I want to do a little preempt on why I know we're all here today, because we're also convening all across campus, whether it was yesterday at the town hall, in your school meetings that are coming up over the next couple of days. I want people to know that we're also going to be doing conversations to help us so that we can talk about what's happening in our classrooms, what's happening in our office hours, what's happening when we go to the dad for coffee. Okay, so please be on um, alert. There are going to be some things, hopefully we're going to send one announcement because your inboxes aren't full enough. Mm -hmm. um, and we are working to do some things to make sure that people who are having great experiences can share those. And for most of us who are sort of like, Am I even having an experience? How do I do this? What is the way to do that? So um, please know that this is just part of what we're trying to do at CTRL. And, and I have to say, the other day, um, David came into my office, David Rose, who I think if you don't know, by the way, he's the man behind all the open resources. We're going to talk about him in a second. But David comes in my office. He goes, Jill, I'm really nervous. We actually have a lot more people signed up. What if they all really come? And I said, this is a problem I would love to have. So I want to thank you guys for being part of one of the problems that is a great problem that crosses my desk. Because what a better way to show our students that we are listening, that we do care about their educational experience, than really trying to identify ways in this case, to lower the price associated with taking our courses and potentially opening them to resources that they may not otherwise even know exist. So just by being here, I want to say thank you because you are showing that you care about your students. And that was something we heard yesterday very powerfully. There is like, what are you doing? And by being here this morning, you're really doing something for your students. And um, I hope that when you go back in the classroom, um, even if this isn't something that you do tomorrow, it's something that you say to your students, I care deeply about, and I'm going to work really hard to figure out how to make that extra price of my course go from $250 to $100, or maybe even to zero. Okay, but the idea is you're here, so I want to thank you. We have a really full agenda. We're going to caffeinate you this morning. We're going to feed you in the middle of the day. Um, and if you guys want, we can always raise the window shades because I know some people like to know that it's really beautiful outside. <laughs> and as forecast, the northwest winds are flying in, so you can hear them swirling a little bit today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, and invite my colleague, David Rose, who um, works in CTRL, works with faculty around a number of instructional um, areas, but is really deeply passionate about open education and the Open Education Resources Program. So I'm going to let him tee off and kick off today. And thank you. Where did he hide? There he is. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for being here. Thank you for tolerating my many reminder emails. Thank you for being here. Um, just, yeah, it, after this session, we'll contact you all with instructions for the review. Um, and so please, if you haven't signed in in the back corner yet, please do so. That's how we'll get in contact with you. Um, and if you have questions about Open Textbook, about Open Educational Resources, how you can get involved further after this workshop, um, please just email me. Um, there's a card in the back with my email address. Um, it's also just Rose, R-O-S-E, at American, pretty easy. Um, but other than that, David Ernst is the founder and head of Open Textbook Network, and um, I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, guys. Thank you to the list of thank yous for coming here today. I think, as has been mentioned already, we have like the next two hours together, and then there's also lunch if you choose to stay for that. So that's a big chunk of time for very busy people. So um, that's not, uh, we recognize that. So thank you for 
taking that time and I'll do everything I can to make it worth your while. I hope at the end you feel it has been. If it hasn't, if it wasn't, if it doesn't end up being worth your while, please let me know, but I hope it does. Um, so yeah, I'm David Ernst um, from the University of Minnesota. Um, the director of the Center for Open Education there and um, work for the Open Textbook Network. We founded this basically to to uh, help other institutions think about and work on this open education space, which we're going to learn about today. If you don't know what open education is, don't worry about it. That's what we're going to cover today. But um, my background, just really briefly, because it kind of comes into play here, is education. My degrees are all in education. Um, educational technology. My program was called Learning Technologies, my PhD program. Um, People who go into that kind of thing, like like David and you know other educational technologists, tend to be people. You probably know some of them who like the newest, shiniest technology, right? And kind of want to see how we can use that newest, shiniest technology to improve learning, you know, teaching and learning. I honestly, when I first when I went into this field, never imagined that uh, I would be spending a big chunk of my career talking about <coughs> textbooks. Definitely not thought of as the newest, shiniest thing, is it, right? But I am committed to this. I wake up every morning committed to this. And it's not because it's the newest, shiniest thing. It's because of all the things in the last 25 years in EdTech that I've worked on, I am convinced that this is the thing that can make the biggest difference for our students. Of all the technologies I've worked with. <coughs> Again, at the end of the day, we'll see a few agree. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but um, we'll go from there. Uh, but I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh, textbooks, I love textbooks, let's talk about textbooks. It, it, not really. It's really about this. This is what motivates me. Right? And this is from the UN Declaration of Human Rights saying that every student should have access to higher education. And um, I will admit that when I first saw this, with my kind of U.S. Western-centric perspective, I thought, oh, those poor people in other countries don't have access to higher education. But as I've worked more and more on this project, I've realized that um, there is an issue here right, right at home. <coughs> this is a study done from the U.S. Department of Education that, that shows that in the first decade of this century, that there were 2.4 million students who didn't complete higher education because of cost. Now, there were a lot of students who didn't complete higher education, a lot more than 2.4 million, but 2.4 million were attributed to cost. In other words, if it wasn't for the cost, they would have completed their degrees. These are college-qualified students. These are students who did everything right in high school, took all the right courses, did well enough to attend college, all of that. The study basically said that though that 2.4 million students in 10 years. That is a lot of students. So this is what I guess basically motivates me um, access. Now where does this come from? Like what's the problem here? Right? Why is this suddenly, why is this an issue? Um, I come from a public institution, right? The University of Minnesota. And as an example from a public institution, this is what public funding looks like nationally. Our two main sources of income are, are uh, tuition, the purple line, and state funding, the yellow line. I was finishing my undergrad just right in here somewhere, and you can see basically the percentage of my, the load that was on me compared to the load that was on the state. And how that's changed today. It's just different for students now than it's really ever, that's the Cliff Notes version of this right now. We're going we're gonna to spend the first 20 minutes or so kind of defining this pro the problem. And then we're going to go on to the solution. So um, the first 20 minutes, you might, by the end of the first 20 minutes, you might feel a little depressed. I'm going to warn you. <laughs> okay. Um, but here's where we're at today. And so I, it doesn't really matter. When, I don't know when you ever, when you went to school, but it's different now. It's harder financially for students. This is American University's tuition. Inflation adjusted. Inflation adjusted <coughs> numbers. Basically, the load on, on students. And I'm not trying to call out American here. I'm just <laughs> trying to say, 
you're in the same kind of boat as publics and other privates as well. It's just this is just the reality of higher education, right? So, given this, if you have a student here and you have a student here, what kind of choice? If someone's going to survive this, right, and really make their make this happen, what can students do? They need more money. Where are they going to get more money? They have kind of two main avenues for that. Well, that's to work. Work more. Maybe they work more, right? Well, no students at work. Full time jobs. Some of them, yeah. I know uh, last week I had a student tell me she had four jobs. I don't know what it, it added up to more than one FTE. They were all part time jobs. She had four different jobs. Um, what's the other option? Working in loans, right? Those are the big strategies that students can use that they that, that are available to them. So let's look at that for a minute, and let's look at uh, first talk about working. Uh, again, University of Minnesota data, because that's what I had access to. This is a graph showing the number of hours that a student would need to work at a minimum wage job, right, a student job, to afford a year of tuition at the University of Minnesota. And the University of Minnesota's tuition is about 13000 a year. You look back in the 60s through the 80s or so, you're, you're talking 200, 400 hours, right? So let's do the math on that. 40 hours a week, 400 hours, that's 10 weeks. Summer job. So if you went to school back here, it's possible maybe you could work all summer and make you know, a pretty big, big contribution. This is just tuition, not room and board. This is just tuition. You could make a pretty big contribution to making it through school. Today, we're up here. And a full-time job year-round would be, let's say, 52 weeks times 40 hours a week, 2,080, right? If you multiply that, 2,080 hours. So they're getting up there. They're maybe, you know, three-quarters of the way, two-thirds, three-quarters. It went down recently because the minimum wage in Minnesota went up, right? So they didn't have to work quite as much. Where do you think uh, American is? Yeah, I'm sorry, I had to shrink the graph to get it up here. Yeah. Right there, 3,440. So they're going to work their way. Now, of course, this doesn't take into consideration um, financial aid that they get, which in a private, you get a lot more uh, need-based financial aid than in a public. But just using the raw tuition numbers, that's where we're at. Okay. Borrowing money. So the average borrower in the U.S., about two-thirds of students borrow. Um, oh, they graduate owing about $30,000. At American, it's 34000 And about 60% of your students borrow. So right in there. So Nationally, if we look, um, I, I think this illustrates the point of kind of it's different than it's ever been before, probably as well as anything. The yellow line here is uh, credit card debt nationally. You can see the little blips there. That's the holiday season. <laughs> right? um, but the purple line is student debt. And you can see where the financial crisis happened here. 2008, 2009, people maybe slowed down their spending a little bit. And it's starting to pick up a little bit again. Student spending just shot right up. And the thing that's most uh, shocking to me about this one, when I first put it together, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Look at this is 11 years ago only. That's 2006, not that long ago. The national student debt was under half a trillion dollars, $500 billion, right? And 11 years later now, we're over $1.4 trillion, almost tripled in those 11 years. And I, I think you, uh, it's, it's clear why during the last election cycle you heard lots of policy around affordability in higher ed, right? free higher education, and so on. Right, it's becoming a real crisis. Um, do you have a food shelf on campus? Do you know? Yeah? What? It's just opened. Just opened. That's the newest trend in higher education. I think the last, I don't even know, last eight or nine yeah, uh, campuses I visited have all just opened or have opened food pantries. The number of homeless students um, has, has shot up. So what are these costs, right? What are these costs? This is, these are the categories that the federal government um, 
basically asks every institution to report, to give an estimated cost of attendance so that students will kind of know what to expect when they attend. They've broken it up into these five categories. Any guesses as to which one we're going to talk about today? <laughs> right? You know which one. It's going to be that one, right? And now, um, is that the highest one on here? No. Not even close, right? I would be perfectly transparent about that. That is not the highest one on this list. We know that. Right? The highest one is probably here. What is board. The Sorry? What is the breakdown of percent? Uh, it depends on where you're at. I mean, uh, it depends on the institution, but you know what's your tuition? 40 something. Again, minus financial aid, room and board. I think uh, for American, I think you, est you estimate, I mean, the institution estimates for students it's about uh, 13,000, something like that, is my memory, or maybe a little more than that. I'm sorry? I have a freshman, yes. It's, you know, from firsthand, right? So, Books and supplies, well, we'll get to the other ones, uh, the books and supplies at least, but I do want to though just be like absolutely books and supplies, the one we're going to talk about today is not the highest one and, and not even close. So why are we talking about that? It's what we control as faculty. There you go. It's, it's the one, unless someone here can, anyone got tuition and fees in their pocket, I mean that they can control. Right, it's the one that you can do something about. In fact, you are the only ones who can do something about it. No one else can fix this, or no one else can improve it. Just, just instructors, just faculty. There's one other reason too, and it's, it's, even though it's not the highest one, that cost has a disproportional amount of impact on student success, if you think about it. It's kind of where the give happens. You know, if students are under financial stress, well, they can't really give on tuition and fees much, right? If they're going to go to school, they have to pay that. They have to live somewhere. Here's where, and I think, and I, you know this better than anybody because you see it in your classes. You know that this is kind of where the give happens, right? So if we look at textbook costs, this is why they, they've become such a hot issue. This yellow line here is consumer price index. That's inflation. That's the rate of inflation nationally. Textbook prices have been going up about three to four times that rate for a long time. The college board says that students should expect to spend about $1,300. Oh, excuse me. Um, an economist from uh, the University of Michigan, Flint, did a study and said, I'll read his quote here, textbook uh, prices have all been going up at a much faster rate than any other consumer product. So think about things you think, any other consumer product, period. Think about things you think of as going up quickly, like health care or tuition or whatever, housing. Textbook beats it. Uh, textbooks beat it. So um, the College Board estimates that students should spend about $1,300, should budget about $1,300 on textbooks every year. At American, you tell incoming students that they should budget $800. Again, you have this estimated cost of attendance that every institution does. That's where that number comes from. If you Google American University cost of attendance, you'll find the same number. I want to point out, you might feel really good about this, which is fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but while it's required that every institution report it, they don't tell you how to measure it. So every institution could measure it a completely different way. I know in Minnesota, ours is at 1,000, and it's been 1,000 for at least six years. <laughs> even though it's been going up at four times the rate of inflation and whatever. So I, have, I don't even know how they estimated it. But anyway, I'm just, it's not a bad thing, but keep in mind, yeah. How is the uh, textbook inflation tracking compared to tuition? Is it uh, approximately the same rate? or Higher than tuition. Higher than tuition. Higher than anything, yes higher than tuition, quite a bit more. Yeah. So while the College Board says you know $1,300 is what they should budget, they don't spend $1,300. Studies will say they don't spend that much. They spend probably in the range of six, eight hundred, something like that a year, on average. Why do you suppose that is? You know about books. <laughs> right. Also, you can often get on Amazon and get books for a fraction of the cost. Yeah, there are, 
there, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. There are a number of things students can do to try to get by, right? And, and actually, this is where um, the important conversation is going to happen. This is where this kind of um, uh, this uh, academic success challenge starts to happen and what students are choosing to, to do. Speaking of students, um, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't been a student for a long time, an undergrad at least. Um, and since this is all about students, I really thought it was important to kind of bring in the student voice. And I, so I do have a, we set up a camera up on, out on campus and just recorded some really simple, um, asked them some really simple questions like this one. And um, I just wanted to, we have a couple of these, but just two of these. I just want you to kind of hear their thoughts about just from this simple question, what do you think of the cost of textbooks? I think they're really valuable, but the cost is just a little, little too much for students who are already paying a lot for tuition. More manageable because tuition's going up, everything's going up, cost of living's going up, and then textbooks are going up. There is definitely a value to them, but maybe not for the cost that we pay for them. I mean, I guess professors are trying to uh, provide students with books that are reasonable, but I mean, there are some textbooks that are just. Um, they're just way too pricey. I just feel like they're really overpriced. Yeah. I get frustrated when a, uh, you have to buy a book that's expensive that you don't use. Textbooks are only used for so long before you're done with them. So it's like, you know, use it for a couple months and then probably never touch it again. If people weren't just um, issuing new editions and just increasing prices, rather stick to what you have. And it's kind of expensive. And sometimes I feel like I have to buy the textbook because um, it is required. But it does kind of suck to like throw away so much money on something that you'll only use for a semester. They, they should keep the same textbook for several years because the material doesn't change that much. I have purchased them and I don't use them, which is kind of frustrating. I think it's outrageous, actually. Um, yeah, it costs way too much in general, I think. So nothing worth sharing. I mean, you didn't learn much. You've heard, well, not necessarily about your classes, I'm not saying that, but you've heard, you know, it, it, it's a re these are reasonable voices. Um, as, an, as an aside, I had a faculty member say to me the, uh, a while back, it's pretty clear that the University of Minnesota's bookstore doesn't need to sell books because they're doing really well with apparel. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like every single one of them has them somewhere on them. Um, no, anyway, so. But I think what's important, what strikes me about what those students said, and, and none of them, by the way, said, oh, we're not paying enough for textbooks, or, or even it's reasonable. They were all like that. But the comments aren't unreasonable comments. They're not like, textbooks are stupid, or it, they were like, yeah, I get it, but, right? And, and pretty much every student, what they said was, a, if I were to back out and kind of summarize what every one of them said, they were making value judgments. Right? It's like, yeah, I know they're trying to, or, but and it's, it's always kind of about value. They're overpriced. That's a value statement, right? They're, it's about value. Um, I have three boys, three sons. I can't call them boys anymore. <laughs> There's so, three sons. Their uh, last academic year, not, well, actually two years ago, a year and a half ago, they were all in college at the same time. Oh, oh. <laughs> right? But, uh, and uh, it was challenging, but it's not like it was a surprise. We knew this was coming for 18 years. Right? <laughs> but um, when, they, when they started, um, we had a conversation with them. We sat them down and said, okay, we're willing to help you with this financially. We'll do what we can. You know, you need to contribute to, they all had some sort of part-time jobs, summer jobs, whatever. You know, we're willing to help, but you need to live like students, right? You need to live like students. So at the beginning of every semester, I'll ask my, I will occasionally ask my sons, like, hey, did you buy your textbooks yet? What do you suppose their response is? You know, it's generally kind of something like this. It's like, they, they know they should be saying yes to me, uh, but they say, well, I'm, I'm just going to wait to see if I really need it. Anyone familiar with that? Yeah. Right? You know what that is? And I'll kind of say, no, you need, don't, don't, you got to do this, right? This is part of the class, you need the materials, blah, blah, blah. But at the, uh, something I don't say to them, well, maybe I should. I actually really appreciate the fact that they are making value judgments when I just told them to live like students. 
right? I mean, they're doing exactly what I asked them to do. And oftentimes what happens is freshmen will come in, buy everything. Mm -hmm. They'll have one or two or three experiences where, effect, like you heard on the video, like we bought a $200 book and they didn't use it, or, you know, they'll have a bad experience, which is not uncommon. And then they'll start making decisions based on that, and it's a value judgment. Again, I'll tell my, my sons, like, no, you got to do it, man. You got you to you gotta do this. But I, at the same time, this is what students do. They have to make value judgments. Either, because most of them, I'm sure, are either told the same thing that we told our sons, or they don't need to be told, right? They are just living it. But yes, ma'am? I was wondering how you define using it. You, uh, sorry, define what? How do you define using it? Like, if you are assigning reading, and the reading is on the test, like, like what is using it? What is using? Uh, like, I, like I, how do the students evaluate whether they're using the book or not? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Anybody answer that? I. I, guess, I, I would. Yeah, go ahead. I, I can say. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I, if all of the material was like covered in lecture, I could sometimes get away without reading, if, right. if everything that I was going to be assessed on was in the lecture. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, so that's. That's the reality of it. And I, I just want to, I, I mean, I can understand the student perspective of it. It's easy for me to kind of blame my son, like, oh, come on. Like, but at the same time, I get it. So here's what they do. They, they do more than just delaying buying. They do these things. This is what we hear from students all the time. I have five strategies here that I think are kind of the most common. They purchase an older edition. They delay it, like I just talked about. They never purchase the book. They share the textbook with others. That's one of the last, I'd say, two years has become big, sharing. Like one person will buy it and then share it with a bunch of others. And then this last one, downloading textbooks that they can find, PDFs of textbooks they find on the internet. And by that, I don't mean buy them. Yeah. Right? You understand what I'm saying? What about the library? So, good question. She said, what about the library? So. There are all sorts, like, the li do you have, like, a uh, in the libraries here, do you have the library buy some books for courses? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have reserves? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So the li some, in some campuses, that's the case, where you have library reserves, where they'll buy a copy or a few copies, which is great, right? I mean, it, it's helpful to some students. Of course, it's limited in both the number of courses they can buy for and how many books for each course, but it's a good thing. The bookstore does all sorts of stuff, too, right? They, have rentals and they have what, electronic versions and they have uh, and old, uh, used and all those different strategies. Sir? I was going to ask what has been the increase in rental books? Um, I am not an expert on that, but what has increased, I'd say, is the model of electronic leases. Basically, you have access to something electronically for a X number of weeks. I don't know any kind of percentage in growth, but that's where the publishers would like it to go. Yeah, that, I've got two kids in college right now, and they've been using right. Chegg heavily uh, yeah. to yep. rent textbooks. Uh, right. That, that, you know, they rent it for the semester, and but, but, you know, maybe it's 150 bucks right. instead of 300. Right, so there's another example of kind of a private company where you can rent. So there are all sorts of kind of systematic people trying to do something, like libraries and bookstores, and these. So I don't, I actually, I'm, so I'm glad you asked that, because I'm, we're not talking about that. That exists out here, and those are institutions are doing what they're doing. I'm talking about like what students, even given all that, strategies they're using to kind of survive this. Even given all the things, libraries, bookstores, and everyone is doing. I, now, yes, sir. One, one thing I did, and I, I don't know why nobody's thought of this, is to uh, have a faculty desk copy exchange system for faculty students. I was able to pick up a few of the freshman texts for my daughter uh, from psychology profs, sociology profs here on campus mm -hmm. at desk copies. And I would love to see somebody to, you know, yeah. somebody monetize that or, you know, take advantage of that sort of charity yeah. thing for, for right. college professors. Right, <laughs> right. Because <laughs> right. I can't call, but I'm a business school professor, I can't call up a uh, you know, engineering uh, textbook producer and say, can I have a desk copy? <laughs> right. Intro right. to engineering book? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, right, and, and I didn't even mention, right, bookstores and libraries, but what individual faculty are doing as well 
to kind of make it work as best they can for their students. There's all those strategies too. So when we look at student st strategies, um, I separated this last one because it's a little different than the first four. How is it different? It may be a legal, it may be taking a legal risk here, right? Okay, I'm not going to actually talk about this one much at all. It, and about, I think about a third of students say that this is what they do. Um, these other four, they're not taking a legal risk by doing these things, probably. But they are taking a different kind of risk. What kind of a risk are they taking? An educational, academic risk, right? So I want to just briefly kind of look at each of these and what students are doing. Purchasing an old, so I'll start with that one. Purchasing an older edition of a textbook. <laughs> right, now, this is, this is a student told me this a few years ago. This, this young man said, said to me, I was asked to buy an $80 French textbook, and I found one that was two editions older on Amazon, and it was eight bucks. That's the one he said he bought. And then he said to me, and this is, kind of, this, this is why this stuck in my head, he said, I know I'm taking a risk. Like the readings might not be the same. And to, I mean, I liked his justification, <laughs> but he also knew, like he knew French didn't change it much, but the readings might have, or the page numbers, or the whatever, right? The content could have changed into edition. So he understood it, but it was the risk he could afford, he felt like. Something he, it's a risk he took on. So, you know, I talked about my own sons and kind of their value judgments, but there are also some systemic areas where students are basically kind of stuck delaying purchasing. This is a statewide, in Minnesota, statewide uh, survey of students saying they had to wait till after their financial aid comes in, which is what, three weeks here maybe, right? Or, sorry, after the drop deadline, when the financial aid comes in. Three weeks in is the drop deadline maybe? Something like that. That's typical, right? That, and financial aid doesn't come until after that because they want to make sure you are in the class before they pay you for it, right? So um, the same thing is true for if you have um, students who are on the GI program, is my understanding. I've been told this by other faculty that there's a delay. There's the same kind of thing. So students may be going three weeks without, um, without the materials. It's not uncommon. Does anybody see that in your own classes? Right. Second video, um, basically same thing, asking students, have you ever delayed purchasing because of cost? I usually wait until uh, I feel like there's a need in the class to buy the textbook, or if I'm falling behind and I can't find another resource for free online that um, would also give me that information, and then I'll buy a textbook. I have delayed purchasing a textbook until it was completely necessary to have it. Yes, I have. Unfortunately, <laughs> I had some troubles because of it. Textbooks are obviously something that you really obviously need, and in order to do well in a class, you know, you need to have that textbook. And because it costs so much, I think a lot of people have problems getting the required text, and therefore they have struggled in classes they shouldn't necessarily struggle in. So, uh, like that first student, I don't know if you've noticed, but he said he waits to see if he really needs it, or if he can't get it online, which I assume is what he means is. Strategy number five there. Um, and then he, he says he waits until he's falling behind. Right? And you heard the last gentleman talk about how, oh, it didn't work out so well for me. Yes, I have done that. Right? So I actually think that delaying, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, but delaying buying a textbook has actually become the rule, not the exception. Like they'll just kind of wait it out and see. Right? That's what you were just saying as well. Right? So, not buying a text. So again, an academic risk, right? By waiting, wait till I'm falling behind. Or... I've seen a number of surveys saying between 60 and 70 percent of students say um, that they uh, never, at, at some point in their academic career, didn't buy a required textbook. And that number, I think, is around 30 percent a semester or so. And not only do they say that, but they will also on the same survey, like 90% of them say then they recognize that they're taking a risk, they, but they feel they have to. Okay. Now, the last kind of strategy that they use is this sharing. And I have a little bit of a different uh, approach to this one. I just sat down, it's one more video, but it's very different. I just sat down with one student and just asked him about his experience of kind of, of affording 
uh, textbook, and he has a num textbooks, and he has a number of strategies here, um, <coughs> including not buying them, sharing them. And when I heard first heard about the sharing thing a couple of years ago, I mean that that was becoming a bigger thing. I kind of thought, well, that I suppose it's nothing. I mean, that, that could work, I guess. It's better than not buying it at all. Uh, then I heard him, and I'm, I'm actually kind of convinced it might even. I don't know. Any, see what you think after you hear. This is a student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information system. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people to take the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers. Uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, so I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between <laughs> two of my roommates and a guy down the hall. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, and the other two I just, I don't really worry about because, I mean, I don't have enough money for that right now, to be honest. But it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. Um, but I'd say for, I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now, I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to um, twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done and then I can read the book and then usually I get shorted on sleep or something. Sometimes I've had to stay up as late as... 3, 4, or 5 a.m. and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up and go to class because, I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. A lot of the times it's just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you wanted because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's you, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking. Because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing. Because it's if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it fil fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that because that's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, I'm so kind of shocked because I, I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. Mm. Just this past year, I I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000, and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, been difficult. So, you know, what do you hear there, strategy-wise? sort of the same strategy as using the reserves in the library where you share the books. Even a thousand years ago when I was going to college, That's you true. go to the library and check it out for a couple hours and then give it back. And right. Nobody yet complained, actually, because yeah. this, it, it wasn't convenient, obviously. This right. is more convenient. So right, more convenient. You might only be sharing it with you know four or three other people. Right, right exactly. <laughs> what did you hear? What some of the challenges with it, however? This is what I didn't think about. I didn't realize. Like before I talked to this young man. Night before a test, what do you think happens? It's not Everybody, easy. yeah, everyone wants it. Right? So he talked about that. Like, you know, he's going to, he has to wait till someone else is done with it or, right? So um, he also didn't buy some of the books, right? Yes, ma'am. I was also going to say uh, a lot of students I know who share, yeah. uh, they have access to Xerox. So they don't, yeah. Yeah. they don't stay without a book. The, they just Xerox the number of pages they need. Right, and that probably falls under category number five of strategies, right? Except they pay for that. Except they don't pay for that as well, right? It depends. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they're also taking a risk. But yeah, absolutely, that's another strategy. So 
I guess for this young man, I mean, you didn't hear, I had to kind of cut it together there, just certain pieces. I mean, we sat and talked to him for 45 minutes about, you know, what he, his aspirations, he's in the business school and uh, entrepreneurial management was his degree. He had a full-time job. He didn't mention that in the video, I don't think. Um, he was also getting paid as a medical research subject, which kind of scares me a little bit, but that's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he maxed out his loans, and you heard him in the beginning talk about alternative loans from his brothers. So he was borrowing money from his brothers because he had maxed out all his other avenues. Um, and obviously he's doing whatever he can. You heard him at some point say, it's always in the back of your mind. Like, can I afford to pay them back? Can I, all of this. And I guess, you know, for me, what I learned from this young man is kind of like, what else can we ask this guy to do? I mean, he's doing everything he can possibly do to make it through this. And, um, that's the struggle. You can see then, yes, ma'am. I think it also varies by discipline because sure. if you look at law school textbooks, there's only one, law school? and it's massive. Or you look right. at medical school or engineering, and so I think the issue of expense. He was in a program that I think Business. a lot of the professional programs, the textbooks are expensive. Yeah. If you look yep. at other fields, which is heavily article-based. Mm -hmm. I have three classes. I have zero textbooks. Everything is online. Right. So you should be spending, if you want to download it and spend it and print it out, that's up to you. Right. But yeah. because the field is moving, it's easier to use articles. But I do think it's a disciplinary issue. I agree. Because my students yep. in law school, I see them sitting in class without the law textbook. Yeah. My students in uh, political science download an article. Yep. And I, so I do absolutely. Think that I agree. This problem varies by discipline. It absolutely does. And you look at schools that are, say, engineering schools that you mentioned, kind of the hard science and engineering. You know that eight hundred dollars that that you estimate for students, like um, I think what is Cal Poly, I think, which is a, a polytechnic in California, eighteen hundred dollars is their estimate. Right. All the technical. So absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. You're right. It de that definitely varies by discipline. The risks that we just talked about, if you think about what risk means, it means you might be just fine, but you might not be, right? And you heard some students talking about that earlier. This is a survey done in the state of Florida and of about 22,000 or so of students. It was done twice, not a lot of change in those four years, of saying what is the impact then, the academic impact of these prices. Um, and so I guess if we come... Again, I said we're going to spend this time talking, kind of defining the problem. If you don't remember anything else about the problem, I hope you remember this young man's story and this, these statistics, because this is what it kind of boils down to. This is the impact of it on our students. And Dave? Yes. Yeah. So uh, these numbers, um, we did a survey at AU, uh. we being CTRL, uh, a few years ago in 2015 that report these exact same numbers with our students here just to get a more localized case of if cost is an issue like it is nationally here at AU where maybe it's easier to think, well, our student body is different, but it wasn't according to the survey. Certainly we don't wow. have the same sample size as this survey, but pretty much the exact same. 66% of students said they chose not to buy a textbook at one point or another because of costs. Some said they choose to take classes because the book was too expensive. Um, so these are issues that are here too. Thanks, David. It's good to know. So I warned you, are you depressed yet? <laughs> so that's, that, so I wanted to make sure that definite, the, the problem was defined well, and, and, and that's the problem we want to talk about. So let's talk about solutions moving forward, OK? This won't, it's all uphill from here, or it's all up. Maybe not uphill, but it sounds like hard work. Um, so if we're going to solve this, this right here, if we kind of say this is the problem, solve it. <laughs> And I don't mean make it better. There are lots of ways that a lot, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, libraries, whatever, are trying to make it better. What could we do to make these zero? Like, solve it. Even if it doesn't seem realistic. Don't have textbooks. Don't have textbooks. More specifically... Uh, let me do this. It's not necessarily that the textbook is the problem. It's the cost of the textbook, right? Yeah. So not having a textbook, if it didn't write exactly. So not having a textbook, and you know, using the example, like if you're putting articles online, you're doing, right, that solves it, doesn't it? 
as far as people who want or need textbooks and feel that's important for their discipline, it's the cost that's the issue, right? So not having cost would solve this. Yes, ma'am. And you could also have a system where the students were just included in their fees and then they were uh -huh. issued a textbook. Right, and there are some institutions who do that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, if, um, if, but if there, so if there was no, but if there was no cost at all, um, I mean, that would solve it. The University of Wisconsin Stout does that exact thing. They have been doing it since 1880 when it was founded, which is really bizarre and amazing. Mm -hmm. It still costs students something, but it's wrapped into it, so it's not but kind of a choice. Yeah, they can't opt out of it. Yeah. Yep, sir. on strategies. Mm. How to make it through that. I, the, uh, <coughs> I found strategies fascinating. And in particular, I try, uh -huh. I've tried in the past uh, saying, I don't like any of the basic texts. Right. Here's my outline. Go find one. Get something cheap. Find a book yourself. Find cover this book. And if you can't figure out what the chapters are, come see me and we'll work on it. Right. Kudos, yeah. Uh, I find that that works with older students who are coming back, um, but it doesn't work at all. Okay. At all. <laughs> with high school students, right. which are basically what we're dealing with. With freshmen, you mean, yeah. When they come in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think. Uh, yeah. Kudos to you. I mean, that's, yeah, it, it, anything you can do to help them, obviously, is a good thing, yeah. Well, I don't think this is the direction that you want the workshop to We'll take it anyway. Let's but take it. From a public <laughs> policy perspective, one way of dealing with cost issues would be lower tuition. Sure. And second, lower the cost of borrowing money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And which is why earlier, I mean, we recognized that. Absolutely, we would love for that those things to happen. That's not what we're in control of, but I would support that 100%. Yeah? We have, I mean, our, if you go into our bookstore now, it's rental. Yep. which has reduced costs. And the second option is this is the only institution I have ever been at that doesn't have a local used bookstore. Every other place oh. that there is something that's not connected to the university. But I can't okay. tell you, you know, I was in Oxford and Cambridge this summer and every student, that's the first place they go. The and they go to a used bookstore. And yep. I'm just astonished that we don't think of mm -hmm. alternatives. Mm -hmm. and, and that, again, there are a lot of strategies that bookstores can take, libraries can take, public policy, whoever's in control of that can take, uh, individual faculty can take um, to reduce those costs. So here's the pathway I do want to go down. Um, to, el to eliminate this cost, to actually eliminate it, make them zero, the, co the cost is the issue, right? So if the cost was zero, again, it may seem unrealistic, but I'm just saying, if the cost is zero, there is no student that can say that they failed their class because of the cost of the textbook. Right? Is that true? So these are self-reported. These are self-reported. So granted, that's, I would say, a weakness of this, but absolutely. They are. Yes, ma'am? I think that there's the, you know, what's the material difference you can make, but what's the, there's a difference in approach. Because you might, I could say, my class has a zero dollar cost for textbooks. Mm -hmm. Pat myself on the back. But that student who we saw in the video could still be coming to my class with those thoughts going through his head, with those pressures. I think we have to have an understanding that even though we might change our individual courses and syllabi, we're going to have students in our class who have dropped a different course, who have failed a different course, who've right. been Not your own. who are struggling sure. in our class because of this incredible uh, pressure on them to, to make ends meet that I didn't sure. have. You know, so I think that that kind of... Yeah. Cognitive adjustment that we have to make as well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that would be different, wouldn't it? Yeah. And that's something that might would take an institutional approach to solve, right? 
you can do your part, the institution somehow would have to figure out how to. <coughs> so getting textbooks to zero seems, un like I said, it seems unrealistic. And I want to talk about that, about, about um, because what it seems like to me is like that would be putting the burden of all of this on authors. Hey, do this for nothing, right? Or, I want to talk about some models basically showing how this isn't really idealistic, that it actually is something that is happening, and in fact it's been happening for over a decade, uh, getting free <coughs> free textbooks. Um, is anyone in here authored a textbook? Anybody? Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Anybody? Okay. Um, so oftentimes when it works out like this, there'll be one person maybe in the crowd who, who has. And I'll then pick on that person and say, would you mind answering a few questions? How long does it take? Yesterday I was at the University of Maryland. Uh, there was an author there. She said, forever. <laughs> uh, generally, the answer is a year and a half to two years. And it's you know, squeezed in between everything else they do, right? teaching, research, everything else. It's kind of an extracurricular thing. And it takes a long time and a lot of effort. But, um, if I ask how much uh, they made from it, uh, what did she say yesterday? She said, if I did the math, it would probably be much less than minimum wage, I think is the way she phrased it. And generally that's true. And, and there's kind of this urban myth that faculty are like, you're making a fortune on textbooks. And I know of all the faculty I've talked to, I know one who it's changed his lifestyle. <laughs> right? And this gentleman, keep in mind, this is how I met him. This was in 2006 or so. Shook his hand. He said, "Hi, my name is so and so, author of best-selling textbook." That's how he introduced himself. So <laughs> it was his main job. It was his number one job. And so um, I just want to so recognize. But my point is, um, and the other question I'll ask authors is basically, do you get a lot of promotion and tenure credit for this for writing a textbook? No. Depends on the discipline, but generally no, not a lot at all. So that comes down to then why would someone write a textbook generally, but how about a free textbook? Like you don't get any money for it, you don't get any credit for it, it takes forever. So what I want to do is kind of go through um, some models to look at why this, how this could possibly happen. First I want to look at kind of the publishing model more generally, just kind of how we, it's oversimplified, but it, it'll do for today. How do books get published? So generally how it works is this. You have a publisher who invests in making a book. And it could be a couple hundred thousand dollars, at least. It's not cheap, right? A lot of professional services rolled into that. The textbook is sold. Those sales and money goes back to the publisher. They recuperate their cost. There's money to pay royalties to the author. Boom, right? That's kind of, again, oversimplified. But it's, it's how things, how we understand publishing the work. Right? Um, there's one more piece I want to add to this that's important, and that's this, right there, copyright. Why is that important to this model? If it, if it wasn't there, this model falls apart. Why? Because there's no incentive to to, to do this. If you're going to publish it, you're going to make copies of it, and you don't make any money. Right. There might be one student who buys it, right? The first one. Yeah, the first one. And then, everyone, and then everyone else could copy it, and legally could copy it, right? So it's important. Copyright's important to all of our work, right? Intellectual property, that's what we, we work in intellectual property work. It's important. And it's important to this model, because it protects the publisher, so it would break. Okay. Here's some other models, then. Okay. There are two of them. The first one is a model that um, is... I would guess not our future, but I need to. Re I, I know dozens of textbooks that have been made this way, and I need to make sure it's clear that this happens. Okay, here it is. Pretty complex model. Generally, it says somebody, and you might be one of these people, or you might know someone like this, who didn't like any of the textbooks in the field, and generally put together their own materials, and then put it on the web and said, "Here, people, whoever else wants to use it, go ahead. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything with it." Again, I know dozens of textbooks that have been created that way. Okay, so, but here's the second model, and this one has been growing, um, and I would say growing exponentially recently. What did I add to the model? 
Yeah, right there, the magical funger. Right? We could solve pretty much any problem if we had a funger, didn't we? But in this case, um, here's how the model works. If someone comes in, funder, comes in with some money and says to the publisher, hey publisher, we want you to, we're going to pay you up front to make a textbook. Here's some money. You could publish it exactly the same way you published before. Peer reviewed, editor, whatever, right? The money's going to come up front. That means that there's money to pay the authors. Up front, there's no royalties because there's no sales. Be but the funder would say, but there's one stipulation. We'll agree to do this, but the textbook has to be free forever. In other words, instructors should just be able to give it to their students, not worry about it. Put it on your, what do you use for a course management system? Blackboard. Blackboard. Put it on your Blackboard site. Students can download it and make copies of it and not worry about it. Just It's free. And just, right? That is the stipulation that the funder would have. Um, again, the author would get funding, but not, not uh, royalties, right? There's no sales, so there's no royalties. So, um, so the big question here is, who would these funders be, right? I mean, that's the piece that you need. Otherwise, this doesn't work. Here you go. Um, we have some, fo some foundations have poured tens of millions of dollars into this problem. The Gates Foundation, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and other foundations as well. I'll show you some examples of that later, of books that were created that way. Governments have gotten into the act. California, the province of British Columbia. Two days ago, there was a bill uh, introduced into the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress for open education, for, for basically both creation and adoption programs at university, colleges and universities for this kind of thing. It's called the uh, Affordable College Textbook. Is that right, Ethan? Affordable College Textbook Act. Right? It's been introduced three times. This is the third time. Um, so, uh, something important to pay attention to. There are a consortia of institutions who are pooling their money to do this. CALI stands for computer. You know CALI? You familiar with it? Because the law. A U does with it. Okay. Yep. So, CALI <laughs> is Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. It's a consortium of pretty much every law school in the country. And they pool their funding and create, I think they have maybe about 30 books or so. And they update them every year because laws change, right? So they have to. But the top one here I skipped over, and this is where I think we're seeing the biggest growth, is universities especially, colleges and universities, but especially universities, basically saying, you know what, we're going to own this. We're going to put an RFP out to our faculty and say, who wants to write a book? We will give you some funding for it. We will do whatever support we can give you. Because it's, again, a lot of hard work, a lot of some technical skills needed. And SUNY has created, I don't know, somewhere in the teens, I don't know, 12, 15 books, something like that, maybe more now. UMass Amherst is probably one of the older programs in the country. They've created a few. Portland State, um, they publish about three or four books a semester. They're not pumping out like hundreds of books. They're just doing a few each. But it's growing. And this list is like very abbreviated now. I mean, uh, my institution has made a few. I know Purdue made a few. Oregon State. Uh, but, and and I, could, yeah, I could go on and on. It's actually growing fast. Oh, here we go. Here's the announcement I threw in there last night. Of course, one of the sponsors is my own Senator Al Franken. Quite proud of. Uh, so here's some books that came out of it. Uh, this kind of practice. This is this was made by Portland State. It's a GIS book, textbook. This is a math book that came out of SUNY. Again, I want to point out that the process of publishing might not be really any different than what commercial publishers do. These are peer reviewed. They look really nice if you open them up and take a look. These are uh, these are published at Rice University by OpenStax. You might be familiar with that branding because. Um, these books have caught on more than any kind of set of these textbooks nationally. Their goal was to create textbooks for the top 25 enrolled courses in the country. And they've pretty much done that now. It's taken a few years. They're now on their second editions. These books are funded by these foundations, the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation. Millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars poured into these. 
Yes. So these are these hard copies as well? So yes, you can buy hard copies of these as well. You You'd have to pay for it because it's paper and printing and delivery. Right. Um, so that's just like a, a, but they're free if you get the online yep. version. Um, here are the Cali books, the legal books. I believe these come out of, actually Cornell, I think, is who actually publishes them. They pull their money and it goes to Cornell. And this is an old screenshot. We can, again, see that each book has a year on it because they do update them because they need to. So that comes with, uh, that's a concern. So, so this model is, is really growing quickly as higher education is kind of taking control of their own destiny in some ways here. There's one piece of this model, though, that is missing, just like there was at, the, at this other model, and that's this. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I might say this. If you are a copyright expert, excuse me, I'll do the best I can to say this, but when you make some intellectual property, you by default have a copyright. There's nothing you need to do to have copyright on it. You don't have to put a C on it. You own, the, you own your intellectual property you create. Putting a copyright symbol on there is just telling other people, like, this is mine. But it's yours regardless. Am I wrong on that? Okay, I think I'm right on that. <laughs> so, but anyway, what my point is, if this publisher makes something, they own the copyright. If they hand you that book and say, here you go, like, give it to your students, put it on your Blackboard site, share it, download it, kind of copies of it, just, it's free, so don't worry about it. Would you have any concerns, intellectual property-wise? Hint, you should. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I feel like one reason you copyright things is for the monetary benefit, but the other reason is so that people don't change it and it's misattributed. Like, mm -hmm. like what? I don't know if this would be an issue with this, but if someone wanted yeah. to, you wrote a textbook and someone like completely edits out the chapter about evolution and puts in some <laughs> other chapter, yep. and then distributes it like it's the same thing. We'll get to that. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. That's something that copyright protects for right now, yeah. right? Yeah, we'll get to that. Good, good point. Yeah. So I have a book for my class, and yeah. the author is from Portland State, and it's flat world. Does it fall into this? I don't know, but I can tell you one way to tell whether it falls into this. That is exactly my point. If you know, I said Portland State made a bunch of them. You have one from Portland State. Your question is, can I do this with my book or not? <coughs> How do you know what this arrangement was? You have no idea. So what do you do typically? I'll get back to that. I'll show you how you can tell. Um, what do you do if you want to use copyrightable material in your course right now? Like something you know is as a copyright and what do you have to do? Let's say you want to make copies and hand it out in your class. What do you have to do? Just say that it's copyrighted and you're, they're not supposed to. You have to, to ask permission. So there are some instances where you might just be able to use it under fair use, which we're not going to get into. That's all another part of copyright law. But generally, if you want to copy something, you need to ask for permission. I don't remember who, I don't know who said that earlier. You need to ask for permission. Do you have a, like a copyright <laughs> clearance office here? You don't have anything like that? Some campuses have actually a center where anyone can go, and they will go and clear the copyright for it. Like they'll contact the publisher, come up with some arrangement. Okay. It, it, some campuses don't. But what, what the end result of that is a license. The publisher will give you a license and say, okay, you can make this many copies legally. Here's a legal agreement, right? Copyright is a legal thing. So you need a legal solution. Here's a license. You can make 50 copies. It'll cost you, you know, $20 per copy. Here's the deal. Everyone then knows they're safe. I can make 50 copies. I don't have to worry about it. I have a license. So to understand the intent up here, what we need actually is a license so that these end users, like you, know this is meant to be free. I can do this stuff with it, right? So copyright in this instance, while well, copyright is, again, a good thing, it protects all of our intellectual property, it's not sufficient here. We need a license. We need an understanding. Now, that may sound complicated, <coughs> like, oh my god, really, this is all about legal, right? The great thing here is that the solution to this is a Creative Commons license. How many people have heard of a Creative Commons? Okay, quite a few. Good. Nonprofit. It's a nonprofit. Um, started uh, Larry Lessig, if you know who he is. He ran for president briefly uh, last round. Uh, but anyway, its whole point is to create licenses for people who want to share their copyrightable intellectual property. 
They create licenses for people like you and me who may not be lawyers and able to tell people downstream from me, like here's my stuff, here's my intent, I intend to share it. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about the copying or the whatever, right? So I still am the copyright holder. Like let's say it's my book. But if I put a Creative Commons license, if I license it with a Creative Commons license, I'm basically saying I'm still the copyright holder, I still have rights, but I'm releasing some of those rights. I'm just telling you, here you go, I'm releasing some of my copyright rights. There you go. So that's what this symbol means. The CC is Creative Commons. It's not closed captioned. <laughs> I think that's in a square, isn't it? Um, so that's the last thing you need on this model is a Creative Commons license to tell you and tell your students that, you know what, it's okay to copy this. Uh, and so uh, in addition to that, so we're talking about affordability here. There are also some other things that these licenses allow you to do. I kind of sum it up this way. It gives you the rights to do these things. You can copy the work. You can share it. So there's where it comes free, right? You can put it on your Blackboard site. Your students can download it, make copies of it. You've shared it. You have those rights now if it has this license on it. Um, you can edit it, actually. So we'll get to that question of editing in a bit. You can mix it with other things. You can keep it forever if you want to, and you can use it for whatever you want. Now, there are some stipulations to that, but that's generally what these licenses allow you to do. I want, one, one point I, did, I forgot to make is things that are licensed with the Creative Commons license, the license is put on the intellectual property up front. So normally, you know what I said, like normally what do you do? You contact them, you give them a call and say, hey, we want to copy this. And this. You don't have to do that here. They, anyone who wants to use a Creative Commons license can put it like right on the book. So for that book, what you have to do is look on the copyright page. And if it says Creative Commons license on it, you know what you can do with it. You know that it's meant to be shared. If not, then not. So they don't want you calling them up. They, they're telling you up front, here's what you can do. So the brilliance kind of of these licenses, and these are what the licenses look like. If you see these symbols anywhere, um, this is a, these are Creative Commons licenses. And they're like, it doesn't get any simpler than this, is it? Like little icons. The CC on each, so there's six flavors of licenses. The CC on the license just means it's a Creative Commons license. These little things, these other little components, um, there's actually only four of them. And they're just kind of mixed around in different combinations, different flavors. So if you understand these four components, you'll understand all six of these licenses. OK, you ready? You ready for the quiz at the end? <laughs> there we will have a quiz. So the first one, by, picture a little person there. What that means is, if I, if I have a textbook that's licensed with the by on it, it means this. It means, here's my textbook. You can do any of these things you want, but you need to attribute me as the author. Say with by, right? Only fair. And you'll notice that all the licenses have that by one on it. It's like the most basic thing you can do. If we're going to share it, just make sure if you share it that you make sure, you know, you're not taking credit for my work, you're, you're attributing it to me. In higher ed, that's important, right? We want to make sure that we, people know our intellectual property, that we're the authors of it. So, fair enough. All right, the next one. NC. NC means, it doesn't mean no cost, because any of these could, any of these are, could be no cost at all, right? This means non-commercial. So it means, um, if, I'm, if I wrote a textbook and I have that NC on there, it means, here's my textbook, you can do any of these things you want. But I'm going to restrict your use a little bit. I'm going to say that I don't want you to make a profit from it. So don't use it for commercial purposes. And there are some people who want to share their stuff, but they're a little uncomfortable with the company making money from it. They feel like maybe the company should still come to them and make some arrangement then. So they can use an NC to still kind of control that. Right? The third one, SA, means share alike. And what that means is, here's my textbook. You can do any of these things you want. But if you do this, if you edit it, 
or you mix it with something else. In other words, if you change it, you make a derivative work out of it. Then you have to use on that new thing that you on that new thing you have to use the exact same license. So let's say my textbook, you take my textbook and you Translate it into Spanish. That's a derivative work. That Spanish textbook would need to have, let's say this was the license on my original book, your new book would need to have this exact same license. Someone suggested to me that this should be called license alike, not share alike. Can you work on that? Okay. So, and I agree, I think that would be easier to understand. The last one, ND. Um, it's pretty simple. It means this. Here's my textbook. You can do any of these things you want, except you can't edit it and you can't mix it. ND stands for no derivatives. So it's for somebody who wants to put their stuff out there and share it. They don't mind people copying it, giving it away, but they don't want anybody to change it at all. You have that choice to license it with an ND license on it. So now you know these six, you're all lawyers now. Sorry, I know you went through school for it, but you're all lawyers now. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but I mean, that's the beauty, again, of these is that we don't, we, we can, anyone can kind of understand the basics of these. So let's take a look at like this license right here. If you, if you find a book and it has that license on it, what does that mean? You can, you can use this book in your, put it in your Blackboard site, but give credit to the authors, which is probably already baked into the book. Non-commercial, so you can't make money. For faculty, like us, it doesn't matter, right? We're not selling books. Um, ND. Don't change it. Don't change it. Okay, fine. Right. Now, um, these licenses, have you seen these licenses before? I mean, they kind of stand out. I mean, they're, if you, the style of them, right? I mean, it kind of stands out if you've seen them. They're actually kind of all over the internet because the internet's filled with things that people want to share. Anyone familiar with MIT's open courseware? Yeah. Um, about 15 years ago or so, the president of MIT said, we're going to put all of our content out on the web, on the open web, and it's still, it's there. Some interesting stuff, if you're interested. This is the bottom of an open courseware web page. Up above was a video of a, some physics demonstration, something exploding on stage, I don't remember what it was. But I could then take that video, and I could use it in my Blackboard site. But what do I need to do? Say where it comes from. Say where it comes from. Who, who's the who's the author? Who's, who do I give attribution to? Right. And C. Don't make money out of it. Not a big deal for us again. S A. Share, Share alike, which means. Same license. If. If I change it then that new thing I make has to have the same license. It's the most complicated one that, of, of any of my things. But you notice, by the way, that the SA and the ND are never on the same license. ND means, SA means if you change it, you need to use the same license. ND means you can't change it. So they're not compatible. OK. TED Talks. You're familiar with TED Talks, right? If you catch at the end of a video, you'll see it go by pretty quickly. But Creative Commons, they don't put the little letters down here, but that's by, so you could take this video, put it in your Blackboard site for your students. You'd have to mention Ted. They do a pretty good job of mentioning Ted. <laughs> you can't make money, can't profit off it. What's the equal sign? Yeah, ND. Someone yesterday said, that's it for North Dakota. <laughs> they thought that that was a rectangle. That looked like North Dakota. Anyway. Now, derivatives, you can't change it. And I don't know why, uh, like for this one, you could make a clip of this. You could take a clip of that video of above and put it in your Blackboard site. That's a derivative, so you've changed it. This one, you can't do that. You could tell students, watch minute three through five, but you couldn't actually cut it, make a new thing, and post it. And I don't know why Ted like, insists on that, but they get to decide. It's their intellectual property. That's the, they get to set the conditions of, of use. Did you look at your book? Does it have a Creative Commons license on it? Dang. All right. So when you see that symbol, we are an hour and plus into this. I'm going to finally use the title of the presentation. 
which is open textbooks. I haven't used that term yet, I don't think. A textbook that has a Creative Commons license on it is what is an open textbook. It's not just a free textbook or a digital textbook, or that's not the definition of an open textbook is one that's free and gives you the rights we just talked about, permissions. So it's free, but you also know that it's free. You also know you are legally, you understand that this is something, you can do these things with the book. Right? You're safe. When we first, uh, when I first started this project, like, what are we, 2017, so six years ago maybe, um, and I talked to the faculty in Minnesota in my own college about this, you know, just kind of saying, hey, do you know that these books exist? They all were like, wow, that's a great idea, but where do I find them? And they, they one thing that they were not comfortable with is like, you know, where do I, am I just going to have to search the internet? Until I find, how do I know? So the, one of the first things we did was create this open textbook library, which I think you've all been to. Right, because part of the invitation involved kind of maybe going there and taking a look at it. So we created this so that there's just one place to go. We're, we're constantly adding ones that are, are being made. Uh, this launched about five and a half years ago in 2012. It had about 80 books in it, 80 textbooks that we could find nationally. It now has, I think I looked yesterday, it was, I think it was 425. It's growing, like I said, exponentially. I mean, every day pretty much we're, yes? So you have these like the textbooks from the rice? Yes, those are all in there. Yep. All of the ones I showed you are, are in there. It's we are kind of the one comprehensive place to go. What was that? Lean pups? Yeah. L E A N pups. Oh lean not lean. familiar. They're online textbooks books that pay, it's yeah. sort of a pay what you want or the author oh. sets a minimum okay. amount that you pay and, and right. they have the PDF of it and hmm. I hadn't heard of that one. And I don't know, it may or may not be Creative Commons, I mean, like, license, yeah, so you know you know anything about Creative Commons. Yeah, sure okay. That yeah, that's one, I'll, we'll look at that. I haven't heard that one before. Sir? Uh, <coughs> one concern I have yes. is that the uh, no derivative yep. uh, is a separate part of it, is that uh, you can get something Yeah. It had been changed oh, yeah. improperly. Yep. Uh, Good point. Wrong material. Right. Uh, and uh, you don't know uh, what you've got. Yeah. And how do you deal with that? Good question. Uh, did anyone hear that? Mm -hmm. So, um, number one, we only point to the original sources of the book, <coughs> we don't point to derivative works at all. Um, so there's one thing. The other thing is that, notice that all the licenses have the buy on it, right, attribution. That requirement, requ it requires you to tell who wrote what. So you should be able to see on a book, if someone edits it, I'll show you an example later, if someone edits it and changes it, you have to say, I wrote this part, they wrote this part here, you know. So there, it's clear kind of where the original piece is and what the additions are, as clear as it can be. Now, as far as accuracy, that's a different question about whether it's right or wrong, but yes. Even with that, yep. what extent is that enforced? Uh, In other words, well, well, what is it that stops me yeah. right. from being unscrupulous, from changing it? Well, if the law doesn't change, it doesn't force you. I mean, because this is a legal agreement, then it doesn't, like, you can do anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a legal agreement, so if if you're not, how would I put this? Uh, well, what's the enforcement mechanism? The enforcement mechanism is that it's like the same thing as copyright enforcement mechanism. You copy something and somebody notices okay. and cares enough, they'll, Ethan, you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to add to everybody. I actually work with Creative Commons on base here at AU, so it's nice to meet all of you guys. Um, I was just going to say that I think it's important to recognize that Creative Commons licenses come with all of the same legal protections that a copyright license does. The thing is that you're exempting certain rights, like you know, the right to reuse and that sort of thing. So when it comes to adaptations, if somebody misrepresents your work, you have the same legal protection as you do under a traditional copyright. So if somebody is misusing your work, you are welcome to sue them. 
Um, so it's the same enforcement mechanism, you know, if whether it's open license or not. Right. Thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Good. So if you have the one, the share of life license, it allows derivative works, and the original work was peer reviewed, and then someone edits it and adds in parts that were not peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. Is it required that that is in the new version, which parts were and were not peer reviewed? It tells you where they came from and who authored them. It, it doesn't tell you the process, just like a commercial textbook today doesn't tell you the process it went through. It tells you who the authors are and who the publisher is. Okay, so you right. have to follow up. You would have to write. Mm -hmm. Again, every book that's in here are original works. There are no derivatives in here. These are written by one person generally or a team of people. But yes, that's that. Things get a little tricky when you start talking about derivatives. Yep, they can be. And it might take a little bit more work as an instructor to say, I'm going to need to do my due diligence here and look at content. Yep. Yes, sir. When you say that the, you know, um, open textbook library, you note that the books have been reviewed by faculty, form of peer review. Is that peer review that open textbook library conducts, or are, they, are you building up somebody else's reviews? Good question. Um, and I'll show you something. That's actually the next thing I want to talk about. The question of, the, t question, the, the question is really about quality. Right? I mean, that's what everything's been about here today, is about quality. Um, and that's exactly what I heard from my faculty in Minnesota. I'm like, okay, we built this library to make it easier for you to find them. So it's just as easy to go as going to McGraw Hill. But then the next question was about quality. I can't vouch for that. My PhD is in education. I can't tell you a biology, an open biology book, or physics book, or whatever, is good or bad or whatever. So I didn't. Like, I just put them in there and let people judge for themselves. Sir? Isn't that why we're here? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is, that is one reason that I think that you're here, is that um, what we then started doing is saying to people who are qualified, like you, to make judgments about books in your field, to actually do that. And... Um, and hopefully give you some incentive or something to kind of recognize the time that it took both to be here today and to do that. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, about writing a review. Thank you. The reviews, we've now so far collected up over 1,400 reviews for the, about 425 books in here. This is what they've ended up being, which surprises me. I didn't expect it to be quite as skewed a curve, but uh, that's what instructors are saying. Uh, part of the review is rating it on a scale of 1 to 5. Okay. The other thing we have, um, keep in mind, this is a collection of things that are coming from all over the place. Just like if you look at commercial textbooks in your field, my guess is you know which ones are good, you know which ones are really bad. It's a, it varies. Same here. There's probably going to be some real clunkers in there. I can't judge whether they're clunkers or not, but hopefully you can. Right, so you're going to get some down here. But there are, so basically, my, I oftentimes get asked the question, are open textbooks any good? And that's what I'm trying to say. It's just like, well, they're just, there are a lot of textbooks. Some are probably good, some are probably bad, I would assume, but yes. Is there a rating system? Because I feel like I always go on Amazon and look at the ratings of different textbooks. Like what yes. people thought when they actually read it. Right, so... I'll sh yes, there is. So what we'll do, what we do with these reviews, these 1,400 reviews, is we put them into here, oh, so that you awesome. can see what the, the, your peers are saying about them, right? Um, the other thing we have going for us now, we didn't when I started, was really some research about quality. And um, actually, these next six slides are not my slides; they are from the Open Ed Group at Brigham Young University, um, CC by licensed. So I know I can copy them and change them. I actually moved some of them around. I made a derivative out of them. Uh, but anyway, so they have two studies, basically. They have two studies of quality. The first one is about perceptions of quality. OER, by the way, is Open Educational Resources. Okay. So their first, uh, this first study was a meta-study of 12 peer-reviewed studies they found about perceptions of quality. What do students and instructors think about the quality? Just perceptions. 5,000 professors, and here's what they came up with, that open content half the time was seen as the same as commercial, 35% of the time open was seen as better, 15% say it was worse. 
I'm not sure I can explain why this is. I have lots of, lots of theories that have been thrown at me. <coughs> But what it does kind of, if I kind of back out from it, it just tells me, well, at least there aren't some huge red flags. At least it wasn't 95% saying they're a lot worse. That was my main takeaway from this. I, I can't explain why this. Some, some say, well, maybe because it's free, students are saying it's better. I don't know. But This is the breakdown for professors and students combined. Yeah, combined, right. And they didn't break it out in these slides. I couldn't tell you what the breakout was. I can tell you then their next study, though, there was about effectiveness, which to me was the important one, where these are actually measures of student success, like grades, retention, those kinds of things, right? Things that we care about. 13 peer-reviewed studies on effectiveness, basically, they had 120,000 students, and this is, um, they were looked at um, effectiveness measures of students, like grades and retention. So this is an opinion anymore, and they basically found that 95% of the time it was the same or better open was than the commercial. Um, and this one I can understand a little bit better. I mean, I, can, I think I could theoretically explain why that may be, given the first half hour of our day here. Right? Every student has it on the very first day. It makes sense that no matter what their income level is, how much money they have available, I can understand why that could happen. Yes? Is there an option to, to produce anthologies on here, i.e. take in mm. text and compiling them together as opposed to writing the book from scratch? Um, sure. I mean, and you certainly could do that if you can find some openly licensed pieces that you want to put together. We're not going to, we probably wouldn't host it in the library, but you, that doesn't mean you, if you find some openly licensed, you have the right to do it. We don't have to even be involved in it. You can use it for your own students. But something that you all likely wouldn't. No, probably not in the library. We wouldn't put it in there. If it's not original work, I said we kind of point to original works. Yeah? Seems to be in, like, you could, assess, you could assign your readings with a bit of different things because they're all free. Yeah. And then in a review, there'd be nothing to stop you saying, this book is great in these areas. I usually use it in combination with this and yeah, this yeah. because those are the areas where it falls short. Sure. Yeah, and you know what happens when you start using free things is that you heard the students earlier saying, I only used this much of the textbook and I paid $200 for it or whatever, you know. When it's free, they don't care how much you use. It's a value judgment. When the cost is zero, you can use as little of it as you want. They're not going to complain about it. You can just start piecing things together and, right. Did you, did you describe how the outcomes were measured, 95% same or better outcomes for those student outcomes, learning outcomes? They are student, they are stu they are student success outcomes. These are 13 studies, so they're varied, right? This is a meta study. So they vary. They vary from grade. Uh, things like grades and retention are the main things that they, they focus on. I don't like the way they summarize it here, but... Yeah, it's just yeah. very vague yeah, it is. Yep. About, you yep. know, is that... Is that kids are happy because they didn't have to pay for their taxes. Right. Yeah, you'd have, if you're interested, I can give you the 13 studies. I do have the, the, uh, the citations for all 13 studies to review. Yes? Do those quality ratings that you showed before, yeah. do they include the level at which the book is written? Because it could be identical, physics one. But it yeah. could be for poets, for right. managers, written by fine men. Or, uh, so right. I can imagine some book being excellent but not appropriate for my context is important absolutely when we write when I'll show you about writing the reviews because again it's an opportunity you'll have there is a place in the review where you can not everyone does but kind of explain some context like I wrote it like for this yes you can write whatever you want some people uh, we've had to review a book like a anatomy and physiology book, and they review it and at the end they say I actually only teach anatomy, so keep that in mind when you're reading this. Those kinds of things, yeah, absolutely. But it's up to you. You don't have to do that in the review, but, but we encourage people to do that. The other piece of it is that you'll see later your name, your institution, your program, everything is on there. So at least there's, there's that amount of context, like what institution you're in, so you can kind of see maybe if it's a community college versus an R1 versus a... But then the rest is kind of up to you to outline. I'm the course coordinator for a core course in the business school, and I went to the Minnesota website oh, nice. in the spring. Do you know Kate McCready? Yeah. Okay. So I had contacted her because basically what I found was a copy or a, an older version of the textbook, of the paid textbook, mm. 
that we have been using for, it's a very good book, we've been using it for a couple of years. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. The Gallagher book? Uh, yeah. In, in any event, the thing, that, the thing that was unusual, and I emailed her back and forth about this, but it's basically the older version, and everywhere it says author, it says unnamed. I can, exp yeah, and I know exactly the and context. I wasn't quite sure, like, yeah. what I could or couldn't do with that. Let's talk at the end. I can explain okay, it all. Great. I can all explain right. exactly what that is. Yep, okay. yep. Um, so let's just look at one book. I just wanted to give you, and I picked this one for a reason. I'll, I'll show you at the end why that is. But this is a physics book, an OpenStax book, written at, this is a Rice University one, again, funded by Gates and Hewlett Foundation. Um, this is a, anyone teach physics in here? Then? So this is an al algebra-based physics. I think they also uh, have come out with a calculus-based one, though, too, or they're working on that. At least I don't know that's out yet. Two semester, 1,300 pages. It's a big book. My understanding is that it has um, like double-digit market share nationally. It's, it's a quite popular book. It's free. You can get a PDF. Uh, you can uh, get an EPUB version, which is, you know, you can read in like iBooks. It's kind of that, an e-reader kind of version. You can buy a print copy of it if you want to. If students want a print copy, they can, and it will cost, I think this one's about $50, upper 40s, 50 or so. It tends to be about 20% of what kind of comparable commercial book would be. So this is easily a $250 physics book, would be my guess. So 50 bucks or so. Again, you're paying for the print, you're paying for the paper, you're printing for the, paying for the shipping. Right. You can read it on the web if you want. Not my choice of reading, but some people want that. This one is also really interesting in that you, um, you can get versions, Bookshare is an online service that allows you to kind of upload content and then get back versions that are, access, have, are accessible versions, like um, Braille printer versions, formats, or the DAISY format, which is the standard screen reader format. So things like that, and a bunch of other formats I'm not familiar with. But this is something you can't do with commercial. You can't technically upload things, and you can't legally upload things, certainly. You know, pub, uh, commercial content. So accessibility offices at institutions are really kind of excited about this piece of it. Um, you can get an instructor solution manual to it. All right, it's a physics book. It's got lots of physics problems in it. You can get an instructor. You can get a, a solution manual. It's not on the open web. You need to actually just email them and say, "Hey, I'm an instructor." And they will look at your email address and check to see who you are, and then they'll send it to you. There are PowerPoint slides, and a whole bunch of things I didn't list on here and, and like um, commercial partnerships they have for like question banks, things like that that are aligned with the textbook. And they may cost students you know, $10, $20, something, I don't, depends on the service. But they're very good at making these, these kind of partnerships to align these tools. So I'm showing you this book for, for one reason. Oftentimes there's this assumption that because it's free, that it's like, there's nothing there. It's like this most basic book. Um, this is not the case here. It's not the case with a lot of the open textbooks in the library. With some, they don't have all this stuff. It's just like commercial books. You're going to get certain things with some, and you're not going to with others. So I, I mentioned this because I just want to make sure that you don't make that assumption, and you just look is all I'm asking you to do. Just look. Might be there. Might not be there. Okay. Um, So, you know, we talked about this affordability piece that we're, I mean, that's, that's what we spent the first half hour on. There are some other benefits to open that have nothing to do with affordability that I'm actually um, almost as excited about. And it has to do with using the permissions you're given on these licenses to maybe do some customizing. I want to stress the fact that you don't have to do that at all. In fact, almost every faculty member I know who's adopted these they just adopt it the way it is. Um, I do know some, however, and I'm going to give you three examples, who adopted it and then maybe after a year or so decided, you know what, I have the rights to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to change some things. So I have three examples. Here's the first one. Um, collaborative statistics. I think this is a CC BY, so just an attribution license. It's made for very, very basic level <coughs> statistics. Right? Not for statistics majors, just very basic. There's an, uh, f uh, three faculty at Minnesota. This is actually the first 
faculty members that I administered who adopted, they adopted this book. Um, whenever you teach stats, you always teach it with some sort of technical tool, right? Like SPSS or R or something like that. They use Excel because it's very basic, of course, right? Makes sense. Um, they use this book for a year. Um, and then after a year, in the summer, they went through it and they edited it. Because they really wanted, you know, within the book, they wanted examples having to do with Excel. They added a whole bunch of problems. I think they added like a thousand different multiple choice problems. Um, so every section in there has some Excel specific content in it. They love the book. I mean, they've been using it. It's exactly what they wanted. They put it back out on the web. I don't know that anyone else uses it. They don't care. I mean, they care about their own students in their own class. I know, so you can tell the new, so collaborative statistics using spreadsheets. Here, they call themselves collection editors. That's a long story. But here we go. We have authors. They list, here are the original authors. Barbara Lowski and Susan Dean are the original authors. They added themselves as authors. This is attribution. At the end of the book, they also have very granular attribution, like who wrote exactly what. So everybody knows. I know Barbara Lowski. And every time she sees me, she's like, oh, the University of Minnesota, awesome. I you know, love that they did to my book. She doesn't use the book. <laughs> she doesn't want to use the book. She doesn't use that. Uh, she's an administrator now, I think. But she, but she loves the fact that this is why she put it out into the world. right? She wants people to use it and make it what they want it to be, which is exactly what these three faculty did. OK. Next example. This is um, a college algebra, the Stitzseeger college algebra book. Um, another Minnesota faculty member who adopted this uh, a few years ago, decided that he wanted to make some additions to it. So what he did was, it's an algebra book, right? So it's full of problem sets. And so in every problem set, he put a link there and said, are you stuck? Click here. And when students click on the link, it takes them to uh, YouTube videos that he made. And he told me, I mean, he made dozens then of these videos, one for each problem set. A lot of videos. And it took him a while. But he, and, I, and that's why I was like, oh my gosh, really? Like you made all, he was like, it was actually really pretty easy because he used his slides from lecture and he just put them on, on his laptop and he talked over them and recorded that. And pretty much every institution has some software that allows you to do that kind of thing. And he did it almost on his own. There was one addition he apparently needed help with. That. I don't know where he got that, but. Adding, it's a little anticlimactic, isn't it? <laughs> Unless you really like vectors, I don't know. In this lesson, so this is one example. These are his slides he uses in lecture, so he didn't recreate those. He just started talking over them. And scale vectors. I just saw him a few weeks ago. He's, um, he's expanding it so more and more instructors in his, in his area are using this resource. You want to learn about vectors? No okay. So basically, um, I mean, it's, I, I like that example because it's, he's, instruct, he's improving instruction there in a way, right? And he's really giving students kind of just in time support as much as a video can do, right? So anyway, last example. Um, this is a course, Project Management for Instructional Designers, that's taught by David Wiley uh, at Brigham Young University. Now, David Wiley is, is a, kind of a leader in this field of open education. He has this kind of, his PhD is kind of in educational technology as well, so he teaches this class. And there is, or at least there was, no textbook that's in that specific course, right? Project Management for Instructional Designers. Um, but he taught this course, it's a master's level course. He did find an open textbook that was about project management. And so what he and his students did during the, for the semester was edit that book and make this one. That was the whole semester. That's what they did. So when they're all done, his student, they have a new book. And you, if you want it, all you have to do is go to, well, you can go to the Open Textbook Library. You can go to pm4id.org, and it's on there. And you can find it there. It's, students are now have authorship credit, which is really cool. They have a new book that they revise every semester. They've written assessment questions for. They've aligned some standards. Uh, they have videos that they link out to where they basically went and interviewed instructional designers about their project management practices. 
right? Again, and, and now these students all have authorship credit, which I think, in my opinion, I mean, oftentimes that's what we aspire to, right? Having students create new knowledge. That's exactly what they're doing here. So anyway, that's probably the most complex of these examples, but um, that's what you can do when you have an open license and you're able to make some edits and changes. And, and then David acted as the editor. So he made kind of the quality checks on it and made sure that what they were doing was um, up to snuff. Whew. Okay, yes? So can you, you, can you link in articles or, I mean, you said Ted, yes, you can link in Ted videos, but can you link in articles? I guess not necessarily if they don't have the previous kind of like this. So when you say link in, you mean from where? So like, from? you know, the, the um, math guy. Um, yeah. Linked in his videos to within the context oh, of right. what he created. So, right. you know, if I'm saying read this chapter, it would be great within that chapter if I wanted them to read also other articles. Sure, you can, can always link out to things. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, can right. I? So do they have to? Do those articles have to be? Right. Uh, no, because those would not be. You're not making a new work. All you're doing is pointing to someone's work. Okay. So yeah, good question. You're not making a derivative work at all. You're just linking to them. So. Um, uh, he linked out to those videos because you can't, it's hard to embed a video in a book, right? I mean, that's why he ended up doing it. It was just technical more than anything. Um, so um, I was, we're wrapping it up here. Almost done. Um, I was told once that, like, if I'm, if you ever present that if you don't ask the audience to do something at the end, then you wasted their time and yours. So here we go, ready? It's an easy ask, but don't worry. Uh, what can we do, um, and, and here's the ask, it's really easy. Just take a look, and, and I think you've all done that already. That's all anyone's asking is just look. You are obviously the decision maker in your course. This is an awareness thing more than anything. This is just to know that these things are out there, they exist, we want you to know what's there, okay? We'll talk in a minute about writing a review, about what that means. Um, think about adopting a book if it meets your needs and your students' needs. Please don't adopt the book if it doesn't, right? I mean, if it's free but it doesn't meet your needs, then what's the point, right? Um, here's something that, that, that actually has had a ton of impact. It's just, there are what, maybe 40, 50 people in the room here. Uh, this is a big institution. Um, so most of the instructors at this institution are not in this room, obviously. Um, what you can do is go back to your program and just do the same kind of like, hey, everybody, just want to let you know these things exist. Might want to look. Or if you're the program coordinator or something, to go back and say, hey, program, let's, let's, we should you know, do organize a conversation around it. Um, at Purdue, at a workshop like this, an instructor came, a math instructor, um, a few years ago, and she uh, went back to her. She teaches. Uh, she still. She teaches. Um, uh, let's see. What is it? Pre-calc uh, one and two. And this is Purdue's an engineering school. A lot of students take pre-calc. Uh, so she basically all the instructors who teach that course decided they were going to switch to an open book, and they now save their students about a million dollars every year, just in that one course. It adds up super fast. So if you want my slides. They are CC by license. <laughs> so um, I'll show you where to get them at the end. But I mean, just in case, I'm not saying you're going to go back and give a presentation. But I mean, if you want some of the information on it or statistics or whatever it is, you're welcome to it. So writing a review. So here's something that you can do if you want. You don't have to do. There's no, no <laughs> obligation here. Um, there's two things you need to do. To, and there's kind of an incentive tied to it, a $200 incentive tied to this. You have to do two things. Number one, attend this workshop. So check, check that one out. Number two is write a review of a textbook in the Open Textbook Library. Two reasons that we're asking you to do that. Number one, your peers then can get an understanding of what you think. Again, I can't judge the quality. We need other people to judge these, the quality of these. Number two, we're hoping it might help you just stop and take a look. That's all. And then think about it, right? So if you're interested, here's how it's going to work. Sometime this week, within a week, not this week, within a week probably, you'll receive an email from me 
So David Ernst, you should never throw an email away from David Ernst. I hear it. <laughs> but this one will have a link in it to the review form. And um, it's just an online form that you fill out. Um, I'll show you some examples here in a minute of what it looks like and what some examples of reviews look like. There's a deadline that the institution has spent, has uh, set up about, uh, what are we, about maybe 10 or six weeks out or so, right? November 10th. The review will be posted in the library, as I mentioned. It will in itself have an open license on it. And the reason, if that freaks you out, talk to me afterwards. But what that basically means is that there are other institutions and organizations who are interested in your opinion as well, and they want to launch their own kind of, um, they want to inform their own faculty, and maybe they might want to use these. So. But if that worries you for some reason, we can talk about it. And af after that, after the deadline is passed, uh, then the institution will um, arrange for that incentive. Want to see some examples? Quick? Okay. That's always the question, right? How long does it have to be? <laughs> when does it do? <laughs> Sorry, but isn't the, yes. like, if it's, if it's, if you want it by November 10th, then we're not really going to have a chance to try it with students. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you. Good point. The question was, if, if you're going to use it, want it by November 10th, you're not going to have a chance. So here's one weakness of what we're doing, is that because one of the goals is to try to get this in front of you right now and to think about using the book, we're doing that before you use it. And we're asking you to write this really short review about the book now. So that is a limitation. Thank you. Okay, so here's the library. Um, I'm going to just pick a book, maybe one that doesn't look so good. Well, I don't know, it's four stars. Uh, that one only has two reviews. I, just, I want one with more reviews. So let's look at, uh, that one has seven reviews. Beginning Excel, oh boy, all right. So. Um, let's look at the review criteria. So first of all, the form that you, the link that in the email will bring you to a form, it'll have 10 sections. Each section will ask you for kind of like a 1 to 5 rating, and then it'll give you some, an area to write. 10 different sections. At the end of the review, then, will also be uh, anything else you want to say. Any context, any understanding of, you know, anything that we didn't ask you, whatever, you, whatever else. So here are the 10 areas. Comprehensiveness, accuracy, relevant, uh, Relevance, clarity, consistency, modularity, organization, interface, grammar, cultural relevance. And uh, let's look at, uh, okay, Virginia State University by Veronica. So let's look at hers. So you can see the ratings on each. And she wrote a very, very short one. I could not open the assignments and test link to check visually to go through the Okay, so she's pointing out some problems she ran into on that one. Here's another one. This one's from uh, Virginia Wesleyan College. All right, so I would say this prep. So I would say the first one we looked at, if you want to kind of look at on average, like what does the review look like, the first one was way short. And I would say this one's a little longer than usual. But the point is, this isn't supposed to be, like if you've reviewed a textbook before, like have been paid by a publisher to do it, it's kind of an academic work. I mean, you are going through very thoroughly in a chapter. This is not meant to be that. This is meant to be a first look. What do you think? It's meant to be on a website, right, to give someone else a first look before they dive into it. Okay, so just to make sure that's clear. Um, Reynolds Community College. There you go. Pretty short. <coughs> it's probably a little bit more along the average lines. But anyway, the point is, again, that you're, you, you're saying what you need to say. It's concise what you can say. Note that I will post it without reading it first. <laughs> so that means oh, I'm not checking for length. I'm not checking for anything, including grammar and spelling. And, and your name will be on it. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, hopefully that'll be enough incentive to, to that. It, again, you can see what's going to be, um, what's on there. Name, title, institution, and the date. Again, that's to give it some context to understand. These are not anonymous. This is, that we want to, we want to know like where the review came from. Okay. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, I think. Questions about it? You don't think that bumps up the ratings? I mean, what, my colleague that? looks at me and says, you reviewed my book, and you, so I see great inflation there. That's why uh, it was all fives in your ratings. Because of what again? Uh, because it's not anonymous. 
And you don't want to upset oh. people as much as... You could be. Would. If that if that's a motivator, absolutely, that could be. I guess I would hope... I would, I would hope, but I understand what you're saying could absolutely be true. I think there are a lot of biases here that could be brought to play, to, to be pointed out. I would hope that you instead would think, my name's going to be on it, I want it to be as accurate as it can. If it's a horrible book and my name is on it saying it's a five star, that would reflect poorly on me, I think. But I also understand exactly, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned you have uh, 425, 425 books. What is your... Uh, goal uh, in the near future, and what are you thinking in terms of improving the feedback mechanism? Uh, are you thinking of adding a flag that says, I use this book? Here's what I'm thinking of. Um, for the library, you mean? Yeah. Um, okay. I got the wrong time of this, but I will keep it to one minute here again. Um, we have no goal as far as numbers go. Our goal is to be comprehensive. Every open textbook that's out there, we want to be doing this so that, so that faculty can go to one place to find them. I'm just uh, curious about institutional pushback, since we have a bookstore that's profit center here, and uh, they like to make a little money off of uh, selling books to students. Are yeah. bookstores going to become apparel stores of the future, like surf shops have? I think that's another two-hour workshop, but I will yeah. tell you from my, from my experience, I don't know about here. I can't speak to the American University's bookstore. My bookstore director was my biggest advocate on Canvas. He would meet with the provost and, and sit there and, and give all the book stats. Uh, the bookstores, many, many, most bookstores, I would say, see themselves as they've been working on affordability longer than anybody. And they kind of see this aligned in many ways. And, and we're not their biggest threat. Amazon and whatever are there are much bigger impact on them than this is. Um, and they are making most of their money off of apparel anyway. So David? Before, thank you, Dave. Uh, before everyone leaves, if you came in late, please just remember to sign in the back. I'm not going to email the big group of everyone who registered. Again, I'm going to email everyone who is here. Dave will email the, everyone who is here for the reviews. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.